on my honeymoon after my uh, second season of shows, uh, I met my wife, we got married and we were on our honeymoon. And she said, what would you regret on your deathbed never having done? And I said, writing a book and getting it published. And she said, okay, when we get home, you need to start spending two hours a day, protected time, make that happen. And that's kind of the condensed 30,000 foot version of how it happened. So joining us now and back by popular demand is Brad Thor. He's a number one New York Times bestselling author. He's got 24 thrillers. Uh, the latest one, I'm going to hold it up here for you, everybody. The Shadow of the Shadow of Doubt. Okay, so let me tell you something. I don't know how you do this, but I do think that you have like a. You could tell me if there's a crystal ball somewhere in that house of yours because you're predicting events that happen prior to them happening, right? So everything in this book could happen, and I want to get into that. Uh, it's brilliant to have you here. I'm a big fan. My mother-in-law is a big fan. And I will point out to everybody that that Brad is a good guy. He wrote a very nice inscription to my mother-in-law, which made me look good. So thank you. <laughs> You're right, but let's start with let's start with you because I want to refresh everybody with your background, how you got into writing these books. And this is obviously a labor of love for you, but you weren't mm -hmm. always doing this. And remember, uh, I'm going to ask you to color this where I have a lot of young people listening to this podcast, sure. Brad. And how do you go from what you're doing, which is a traditional thing, to something that is a labor of love? And when did you make the leap and why? Okay, so real quick, my family background, we're, we're an immigrant family, so to speak. My grandfather was the first one born in America. We're from Scandinavia. My dad went into the Marine Corps so he could go to college on the GI Bill. And then um, I went to the University of Southern California to study business, to take over my dad's uh, real estate development firm. He builds office buildings and hotels. And I hated it. I hated business administration. I would have rather taken a bullet in the head than to have sat behind the desk <laughs> my whole life. And so I changed my major in college to creative writing and film and television production. And when I got out of USC, I had saved a bunch of money. I leased apartments in LA while I was in college. That's how I made money to help pay my way through. In addition to my old man helping me a little bit, but he was really serious about, you know, we, we worked from a very young age in my family. Uh, I think my first job was like seven, seventh or eighth grade. I started pumping gas uh, up in Wisconsin in the summers. So anyway, uh, I'd saved up all this money and I thought I'll do something no American has ever done. I'm going to go to Paris and write a novel. <laughs> of course, tons of Americans have done this. That was just my running joke at the time. So but starting with Hemingway, but yeah, exactly. And Henry right. Miller and on and on and on F. Scott Fitzgerald. So I got over to Paris. A friend had a room in her apartment. Let me have it. And um, I, I, I was very afraid of failure. And so I got a couple chapters into that novel and I gave it up. Mm -hmm. I had that voice in the back of my head that said, why risk mm -hmm. the embarrassment? Maybe the book's going to suck. Maybe nobody's going to like it. So better to not write it at all than to set yourself up for failure. And mm -hmm. I gave into that voice. It was a, it was a mistake, but I traveled around Europe with the money I had saved. And I saw all of these young people with backpacks. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. And seeing my country from abroad, I always felt made me a better American. And I said, I'm going to get back and pitch public television television on a travel show for young people, 18 mm -hmm. to 34 year olds. I came back. It took a long time, but I pitched them. They loved the idea. I got a show on the air called Traveling Light. I was the producer, the writer, the host. I used to make up names for the credit crawl. I used to take friends from high school and throw them in there and stuff because I didn't want to seem like a small time operator. Uh, and on my honeymoon, after my uh, second season of shows, uh, I met my wife, we got married and we were on our honeymoon. And she said, what would you regret on your deathbed never having done? And I said, writing a book and getting it published. And she said, okay, when we get home, you need to start spending two hours a day, protected time, make that happen. And that's kind of the condensed 30,000 foot version of how it happened. And, you know, so that, there's a, but there's a lot there though, right? You have, a, you know, a, my grandfather once said, if you pick the right spouse, uh, mm -hmm. focus on one. Don't focus on many. They'll help you get to wherever you want to go. So your wife definitely helped you. Amen. Second, yeah. the second thing there is you had something burning and some of us snuff that out. We get fearful. We're worried about our paychecks day to day and we don't want to mm -hmm. take the leap. Um, you know, I always wanted to have my own business. So I was at Goldman making a lot of money, Brad, but I said, you know, what? I got to go have my own business. I left. I took a seven figure job to a no figure job <laughs> and uh, everyone thought I was crazy, but it's, it's, it, it was a better life for me because it fit my personality. It didn't hem me in. 
So has has your writing fit your personality? It, well, I think so. Uh, first of all, that's that old uh, that old poem that a uh, path diverged in the woods, and I took the path least traveled by, and it's made all the difference, right? You took your chance, I took my chance. Uh, neither of us are going to wake up on our deathbed saying, "What if we'd only done this?" You know, years ago. So. Uh, the writing, I will say this, Anthony, the the character, my protagonist, Scott Harvath, and for for those of your viewers and listeners who haven't read a Brad Thor book before, I tell people that my thrillers, because I've got the same guy in all the books, Scott Harvath. Uh, he's a former Navy SEAL that does very, very off the book stuff for the for the government. And I tell people that the books are like the James Bond movies. If the newest Bond movie is in your local multiplex down the street, you can go see it. Doesn't matter if you've never seen a Bond movie before. You're you're not going to miss out on anything. You'll get caught up real quick. Same thing with my books. So I tell people that James Bond is, uh, or sorry, Scott Harvath is kind of my alter ego, the same way I believe James Bond was for Ian Fleming and then Jack Ryan was for Tom Clancy. So he gets, to, I, I used to joke that he gets to do the things that my wife won't let me go and do. And if I say that near shot of my wife, she said, well, I let you go to Afghanistan. And I said, yeah, we made sure all the insurance was paid up and all that kind of stuff. But my wife was pretty cool when I wanted to go over there and do some research. So, yeah, he's my alter ego. So that's I get to have a lot of fun writing this character. So, but you're talking to a lot of people. Uh, you're you're talking to intelligence sources. You're on the ground in places like Afghanistan. You're on the ground in other Middle Eastern countries, Asian countries. Uh, the stuff you write, and I've been to some of the places that you write about, including Afghanistan. You know, I I was a part of the business executives of national security for five mm -hmm. years. So. I traveled to Iraq, traveled to Afghanistan on troop support missions. The stuff you're writing about is real. And it's sort of like, I sort of feel like it's near nonfiction. Like some people mm -hmm. are fiction writers, but you're near nonfiction, meaning it's coming up. <laughs> coming up is what Scott Harvath is doing in this summer's novel, except it'll be sometime in 2025, we'll have to deal with it. So so let's set the scene without blowing up the book for people. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about the plot and uh, where, where, where Scott ends up. So uh, I call what I do faction, where you don't know where the facts end and the fiction begins. Right, that's a beautiful uh, word. I like that word. Yeah, and it's one of the reasons, but, and I will get to the book, but the Department of Homeland Security after 9-11 set up something called their analytic red cell unit, where they invited creative people into D.C. to help them war game. They realized very, like the day of 9-11, that, that we got hit and Al-Qaeda was successful because we weren't creative enough. And they were determined never to let that happen again. So they brought in all these creative thinkers from outside D.C. I was one of them to help war game different scenarios. And I refer to that as the Las Vegas of government programs, because what happens in the red cell stays in the red cell. I can't use it for any of my books, but they wanted me there for the way I, I drew up these scenarios. So with this summer's thriller, with Shadow of Doubt, I have a high level, a high level Russian defector that crosses the border into Norway with a ton of secrets that could shatter the West. And at the same time in Paris, a French intelligence officer has discovered a huge secret within the French government. Can't trust anybody in his own government. So he set up breakfast the next morning with the CIA station chief in Paris, but he dies. He's murdered that night before he can get to the breakfast. And then we've got my character, Scott Harvath. He's just come off uh, an operation to rescue an American hostage in Ukraine. He's taken a week. He told his bosses, don't call me, don't email me, don't text me. I'm not going to answer. I'm going to go to Norway and I'm going to meet up with my fiance and I'm taking a week off. Well, when he lands in Oslo, there's a CIA station chief there as well. And she says, we know your fiance is going to debrief this Russian. We need to know what she knows and we want you to spy on her. And he says, up yours, I'm not doing it. I've never said no to my country before, but I'm not going to spy on my soon to be wife. And the CIA blackmails him into service. He has never said no to an op. This one he's blackmailed into. Uh, but there's a twist. He figures out how to turn it around a little bit back on the CIA. So that's the jumping off point for uh, Shadow of Doubt. So friend or foe, I'm going to ask you a couple, I'm going to say a couple of names. You tell me friend or foe. Ready? Okay. Mm -hmm. Vladimir Putin, friend or foe? Foe, 100%. No question. Okay. So why are all these Republicans so sympathetic to him then? 
Well, so here, here's what's going on, Anthony. If uh, if you read, particularly, I don't know if you read Ann Applebaum's book, uh, Autocracy oh, Inc. Autocracy, is her newest yeah. one, Twilight I just of Democracy. That book, actually, I've invited her on. Actually, I just I just bought that book. It's a small little book. I yep. I, I saw it in Barnes and Noble. I purchased it. I haven't read it, but go ahead. So Anne Applebaum, her, her book from two summers ago is Twilight of Democracy. So when you look at the Balkans and other places that have slipped into ethnic strife and conflict, what you find is, is that the one group that had been dominant, that had been the all-powerful group, as they start to slide into minority, they fight back. Uh, and they fight back and lose respect for the rule of law and all this kind of thing. They want to preserve their way of life no matter what. In fact, one of the most interesting statistics uh, or determinants I heard for whether or not your county had somebody at the January 6th insurrection was whether there was a dwindling white population in your county. So that was one of the greatest determinants as to whether or not somebody from your county was at the January 6th insurrection, which is very interesting. So if you look at the Balkans and other places that have slipped into ethnic strife and conflict and one, uh, the minority trying to shove the, uh, the newly uh, minted majority out, that's what you see. Not even out, but to prevent them from uh, rightly taking power. And that's what we've got here. So now with these people who feel their life is in, uh, their way of life is in danger, that the country's slipping away, all of that kind of stuff, they are gravitating towards autocracy. They want a strong man. I alone can fix it sort of a person. And so they respect Putin. They like Putin. And let's let's face it. It is it is absolutely horrific that Trump holds up and slobbers all over Putin and Kim Jong Un and President Xi, all that kind of stuff. So that that's where a lot of that nonsense is well, coming. Well, from. Ab Abelbaum believes he does that because he wants to be them. Do you think that's the case? Oh, I think if given the choice, yes. What yeah. kind of insane person says, I want to be a dictator on day one? What kind of American citizen who who appreciates the founding documents, the founding of this country, what America stands for? Right. Who would even, can you can you imagine Reagan making a joke like that? I mean, that's insane. No, I, look, I, listen, I, listen, I work for the man and I saw how dangerous he was. And so they tried to discredit me the way they fired me and then roughed me up on the way out. Because they were like, okay, this guy sees exactly what we're doing. He doesn't like what we're doing. And so they went to discredit me. So I know exactly what they're doing. I just wrote a piece on Project 2025. That is Trump's agenda. It's a, he, he put 85 of his acolytes in there. Um, but, you know, he's up against, uh, you know, she has some hard left policies. So there's a lot of people in the middle that don't see it as clearly as you and me. And they're like, okay, well. She's got hard left policies. He's not hard left, but he 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 could be it, it, an alligator that eats you while you're crawling yes. on his back. You see what yes. I mean? Yeah. And so for Trump, it's not necessarily the policies he likes. He likes that there's no guardrails, that these guys can do whatever they want and nobody right. stands in their way. Exactly. Everybody falls in behind them, never in front of them and says, stop. That's okay, what Trump so, likes about so, these So guys. Putin, Putin is a foe. And I'm glad Absolutely. you said that because I've, I've seen the intelligence briefings. I know what a foe he is. I know what he's capable of. And I always tell people uh, that Putin's people... Uh, uh, which was written by Catherine Belton. She was the former Financial Times Moscow bureau chief. Uh, H.R. McMaster, who has a new book out, he sent me during COVID in 2020 a copy of her book. I read it from cover to cover. Putin is a foe. President mm -hmm. Xi from China, foe? Foe, absolutely. No question. Yeah. I mean, listen, this is one of the things with the populist agenda and kind of the American first crowd is they don't want America to project power or be involved in other nations, but they still want America to be number one. Those two are mutually exclusive. You can't sit behind your oceans and be number one. If we step off the world stage, she and, and China are going to step into that power vacuum. They are already doing it with the Belt and Road Initiative and have been up, up to it for you know decades. Uh, I think it's I think it's over twenty years now. So this is you can't have both. You can't be isolationist and number one. It just doesn't work that way. Okay, let's keep going. <laughs> I, I'm with you and you and I share the same philosophy and it's evident from your books and, uh, I'm an American first and I'm, I'm a partisan last actually. So I don't even recognize the, the party that I used to be a part of, which was Reagan and Abraham Lincoln's yep, party, but me neither. let's keep going. Okay. Uh, so Scott has been through hell and back. Uh, he's a loner, but he's a friend. He's, mm -hmm. uh, he knows how to bond with people. Uh, he is incredibly resourceful. 
Have you met people like this that work for the United States government? I know the answer to this, but tell us about them. I have. So Scott Harvath, my main character, is basically an amalgam of people who I know that are out doing some of this nation's most dangerous business. You've got to be a self-starter. You've got to be charming when it's ne necessary to be charming. You've got to be able to work well on a team. But most importantly, they've got to be able to put you into some of the worst places in the world, and you've got to figure out how to adapt and overcome. And that's, that's my protagonist, Scott Harvath. Okay. And I agree with all that. Okay. Uh, you, uh, uh, so far passing the test. Good. Yeah. But I mean, <laughs> I mean the thing that you've done well, and I want you to explain to people who are writers that listen, because this is an author's podcast. The title of the book is the title of the podcast is an open book. And it's really me interviewing best selling authors, but you've done something really well here. I have read all of these books. So I feel like I know Scott Harvath, but then I try mm -hmm. to step back and say, let's say I just read this book on its own. Let's say I read Shadow of Doubt on its own. I, I know the book. How do you do that? How do you write a series of books where I can pick up book 13 mm -hmm. and I'm right in it and I didn't have to have books one through 12 or I could pick book book 24. Yeah. How, how do you do that? So it's a, it's a high wire act, Anthony, because I've got people like you that have been with me since the very first book. And then I've always got new people coming on board. So how do I, how do I onboard those new people quickly without boring the old people that know uh, the history of Scott Harvath? Elmore Leonard was famous for saying uh, his advice to young writers, leave out the parts that people skip. So I've got to be careful not to put too much in there. Uh, so what I try to do is when I'm explaining a little bit of Scott's background is I find a new way to do it with each book. I tell maybe a little bit different thing of his, from his past, which will be new to the existing readers and of course brand new to new readers, but it serves two purposes. It gives the existing longtime readers a neat little piece of the puzzle of Scott's background, but it also serves to bring brand new readers up to speed because my editor gave me a great piece of advice as I was going into book number two. And she said, don't cannibalize your own sales. You never want somebody to walk into their local bookstore looking for that great beach read. And they say, oh, here's Brad Thor's book. Oh, this is book number five. Oh, wait a second. If you haven't read the first four books, you can't buy this. And then they go buy a Patterson book or something like that. God help right. them. Right. You know? Yeah. I mean, those, I mean, I don't want to be critical of him, but he. No. Well, and I'm just teasing. J no, 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 Patterson's a great, great writer, guy. Very, great writer. Great guy. He's a great guy. Great writer. But it's very good. I can predict his books. There's a formula mm. to his books. And, and if you read one of them, great. But if you read 10 of them, you're like, okay, I can see where this is going. Uh, I, I can see chapter 22 in chapter four. Mm. Your book, I can't figure it out. So I have to actually read the damn thing. Good. I have to turn the page. <laughs> and so that's my second question related to your writing style. You make it fresh and you make it relevant. And it doesn't matter which book I buy. I'm in the book. But then... Because listen, I have read every spy novel that comes out. Okay, I mean, I am a spy novel reader. Charles Cummings from the UK. You mentioned some of the other competitors you have, which I won't mention on this podcast. But you, <laughs> but you, but you know what I'm talking about. Sure. I can't predict what you're doing. Good. So what do you do? Do you say, okay, the reader thinks I'm going to go this way. Let me go the other way, or or what do you do? So, so that's it. So number first and foremost, my job is to entertain you. So I'm crafting short, crisp, cinematic chapters. In fact, one of the nicest pieces of, uh, one of the nicest accolades I, I get is, oh my God, I, I bought my son your book or I gave your book to my mom who wasn't a reader and now she is. She loves your book. She's gone back and read all of them. So it, what I try to do, there's two types of authors. You get somebody who's a plotter and they outline or a pantser, somebody who flies by the seat of their pants and doesn't outline. And I'm a pantser. So now that can be tough. It can be really stressful because I'll paint myself into a corner and my wife jokes by the look on my face. She can tell if it's a red wine night or a bourbon night uh, when I get home from the office and she says, don't worry, you'll figure it out tomorrow. Uh, and then I'll come in and I'll work it out. But I like to say that I take the first... I, First of all, I want to have the same experience writing these books, Anthony, that you do reading them. I want, Robert Frost said, no joy in the writer, no joy in the reader, no surprise in the writer, no surprise in the reader. So what I, I want to have the same heart pounding, palm sweating experience writing it that you do reading it. So my rule is if it's time for something new to happen in the book, I take the first four ideas that come into my head and I throw them out because if they're that obvious to me, they're going to be that obvious to the reader. And then I start toying with five, six, and seven. And that's where it gets interesting. And that's, I think, what keeps it fresh, exciting, and you don't know what's coming around the next corner. Well, I mean, terrific. Um, uh, 
let's talk about the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm new to the world. I've just landed. My Martian uh, spacecraft has landed. I'm in your backyard. I come into the house. I'm in your beautiful study. And I say, okay, tell me about this world that you're living in. Tell me about the intrigue that you are so on the pulse of, this international intrigue. So go ahead. Give me a briefing. Tell me what's going on. So you're talking about the real world that we're living in right now. The real real world. world. Not the world that we teach our kids. Not eighth grade social studies about America, but really what's happened in America and really what's happened around the world. And, uh, you know, I, I let me let me preface it by saying this to you. I think you and I are two of the luckiest people that have ever lived. And let me explain why. We've grown up in a post-World War II America where America has run the card table. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe it's becoming harder to run the card table, but for 80 years. And we're still the reserve currency for the world, mm-hmm. a result of which there's a ceiling there's an unlimited, as George Bush's dad, George Herbert Walker Bush said, Kavu, ceiling and visibility unlimited. That's mm-hmm. been the case for America for a long time now. Um, but tell us about the world that you were living in. Give me a briefing. So, say, look, here's what America's dealing with now. Here's where the Russians yeah. are. Here's how India's coming into the th- situation. Here's the Chinese. Here's what's going on with the Iranians and the Israelis. Yeah, I, so it, let's let's preface this on the the uh, the aliens at least know that we are uh, what the Westphalian nation state is, in that we've got uh, different tribes. Let's let's say on this planet, we we may, might be all the same species, but we're not all of the same tribe. And just for so, young people, what 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 Brad is referring to is the Treaty of Westphalia. We've really aggregated of ourselves into sovereign nations. And we each have a sovereign nation that represents itself in the international community and a result of which it's tied to certain respected international laws and norms, even norms in war. As an mm-hmm. example, we have a Geneva Convention in terms of how we have to treat each other where we're in war. OK, go ahead. Absolutely. So I would tell the aliens that uh, for the longest time on this planet, we people thought that history repeated. And it's only of late that we're realizing that history doesn't necessarily repeat, but it does rhyme. And I would back us up to 2014, where Putin, uh, via his little green men, basically uh, men in green fatigues that didn't have any insignias that said they were Russian military, though they were, went into the Donbass, basically went into eastern Ukraine. 2014 took it over. Uh, Now, what's really interesting is when the Soviet Union broke up at the end of the 90s, a third of the Soviet Union's nuclear arsenal was in Ukraine. And we went to the Ukrainians and said, please don't keep these missiles. Let us help you get rid of them. We're going to help you deactivate them. You don't want these. You don't have the wherewithal to maintain them. And the Ukrainians were smart. They said, listen, we'll do it. We'll agree to this. But we need a promise from you, the United States, that if we give up our nukes, nobody's ever going to invade us. Nobody's ever going to take our territory. And you're going to see to it. And the U.S. said, fine, we'll sign that. It was called the Budapest Memorandum. And they said, great, you're, the ink is now dry. Get the Russians to sign it. This is pre-Putin. And the Russians did. But then Putin came to power. And what Putin did by going into the eastern part of Ukraine, he said he was there to help Russian speakers that were in that area, which is the same excuse that uh, Hitler used when he went into Czechoslovakia. So when you see pictures of Neville Chamberlain waving around the piece of paper saying peace in our time, that's when they decided to hand over the Sudetenland, this area that had a lot of ethnic Germans, German speakers, to Hitler, thinking it would slake his thirst. So what I would tell the aliens is we are living through both an excitement and very perilous time in our history because a lot of things that happen, have happened in the past are happening again, and not exactly the same way, but similar. Again, history doesn't rhyme, or it doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme. But we're also living through things in history that have never happened before. You know, So you had LBJ that didn't go for a second term, but the Biden thing, Biden's not going for a second term, but there's a flip now. It's Kamala Harris who's now uh, stepped in, and it's a really short race. And the Trump campaign, although they say they were prepared for it, they weren't prepared for it, and they don't know how to handle this. So uh, I I would say if I had to 
you know, the Chinese are on the rise. They're, uh, they are becoming a near peer power. Uh, they have a very impressive Navy. We need to invest a lot more in our Navy. We need to be putting a lot more into icebreakers in particular. I'm, I'm very concerned about that's Coast Guard, but I, it, it is Navy adjacent. So the Iranians, I think uh, I'm on hold with the Iranians because I was really expecting a lot more with Hezbollah and the Israelis. I'm glad not to have seen stuff, but I would tell the aliens, Grab a beer, sit down. Let's watch the next X amount of weeks between now and Election Day in November, because I think we, not only are we living through one of the most exciting points in history, we live in the best country in the history of the world at the absolute best moment. If you were a spirit up in heaven, a soul that was waiting to be born and you could pick any time in any place to be born, you wouldn't know if you were black, Jewish, gay, if you were paraplegic, if you were going to grow up rich, grow up poor. If you didn't know any of that stuff, just you could pick the time and the place, you would pick a America right now today. It would give you more advantages, more opportunities, and it's exciting. So we have roles and responsibilities as citizens because we're stewards of this republic. But I got to tell you, Anthony, I'm not a baseball guy. Politics is my baseball. And this is so exciting. So I, that's why I would encourage the, I, I would hope my enthusiasm would be uh, infectious for the aliens. Okay, so one one follow up question from the aliens. Okay, uh, uh, when I watch the American electoral situation, both sides think it's perilous. Uh, the Democrats think democracy is ending with Donald Trump, and uh, and the the Republicans or the people supporting Donald Trump, if you can call them Republicans, they think that we're going to end up with communism and right, Marxism yeah. in the country. So, are either of them correct, or neither of them correct? So I, I don't believe – so I left the Republican Party in 2018. I worked on two Republican presidential campaigns prior to that. Uh, I worked on uh, Rick Santorum's and Rick Perry's, uh, still friends with both of them. Uh, and I, I, listen, Trump – sat on his big orange ass for three hours during the insurrection, didn't do anything, could have called the people back because he wanted them to be successful. He was hoping that they would succeed. If you didn't want that to go on, you wouldn't be sitting there watching it unfold on Fox News. So he wanted that to succeed. The, no the idea that we are giving him another shot at office right. is reprehensible. It's well, reprehensible. That's, that's Kevin McCarthy's fault, by the way, because McCarthy oh, had right him. Right down to Mar-a-Lago and kiss his ass. He could have yeah. put him right through the ropes yeah, he would be running for brave. He'd be the most popular Republican in since uh, Reagan. He all he had Trump to do could have been banned hey, from office. But think yeah. about this for one second. But hey, I'm the Speaker of the House. You're invading my house. Mm -hmm. who, who would allow that? Only Kevin yeah. McCarthy would allow that. So anyway, only Kevin McCarthy. And then you yeah. listen. There were two impeachments, and nothing happened in the Senate. So there's a lot of Republican senators who have this on their hands too, including Mitch McConnell. Yeah, who but just McCarthy thought he could have broken. McCarthy could have yes. gone to McConnell and Schumer. And yeah. said, I'm done. You're not allowed to do the, that. The dam broke, Anthony, when McCarthy went down to Mar-a-Lago and kissed the ring. I mean, McCarthy gives this big speech about how Trump is is completely responsible for January 6th. And then like, a, what was it, a week, five, seven days later, he's down in Mar-a-Lago. So McCarthy should not be remembered fondly by, I, listen, I love when he kicks Matt Gates in the pills. I love that. I think that's terrific, but I don't like McCarthy. Uh, that's about the only thing he does that I like. And I hope that uh, history uh, remembers him uh, as poorly as he deserves to be remembered. Well said. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm loving this conversation, so I'm going to keep going. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about research. Okay. You're in mm -hmm. Afghanistan, something you learned in Afghanistan that you could not learn about reading about Afghanistan. Go. What is that? <laughs> Uh, let's see. You know, one of the things I learned about, uh, and I had heard about it, but I saw it firsthand. There's this, uh, the Pashtu tribe have uh, a code of honor called the Pashtun Wali. And so, uh, with the team I was with, we didn't go into any village unless we had been invited by the elders because, uh, they would fight to the last man in the village to keep you alive because you were their guest. And what was interesting is I was with this team, uh, and they, they were constantly introducing me as an author as this American author. And I finally had to say, why do you guys keep telling them what I do for a living? You know, can't I just sit back here and, and let them think I'm one of you guys? And they're like, you don't understand. In Afghanistan, two of the most honorable and respected professions are doctor and author. So that was something that I'd never heard before that I uh, learned in Afghanistan. Also, the best fried chicken I ever had was in Jalalabad, somebody's oh, right? house. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, yeah I, I love the food. I love the, uh, love the food. I definitely thought it was amazing. 
Um, how about, okay, how about uh, weaponry? Mm -hmm. Where are we going with weaponry? Well, what, what, what's, com what's coming that the average citizen is not aware of or not ready for? Okay, so there's a lot of underwater stuff that we're working on now. Uh, there's a big drive in the United States for, uh, in our military here, uh, things that we could use against the Chinese uh, in, uh, in a confrontation with China, whether that's around the Philippines, which we are bound to help protect, or with, which with Taiwan. So there's a lot of unmanned underwater stuff, which is very, very interesting. And also that's a big push with NATO. NATO is now standing up a new kind of security center or an operations center uh, because they're very concerned about non-state act, not, not so much non-state actors because it's hard for them, but actual states that are uh, uh, enemies of the West, uh, severing the undersea cables that we rely on for data transfer and all that kind of stuff. So the undersea warfare is, is amazing. And I think that would really shock people, uh, the advancements and how much money is going there and the kind of stuff they're coming up with it's incredible very sexy okay um it's not your last book right brad no I, in fact i just signed a brand new contract with simon and schuster for a few more so happy right, to so keep when them you, going when you, get, when you get writer's block what do you have to do so uh, you know what, Anthony, it's, it's funny The probably I had it several years ago when we decided to move our family back to Chicago from Park City, Utah, and I moved into a house that wasn't complete and it was just noisy and the kids and all this kind of stuff. And I had terrible writer's block and I did some research in the best piece of advice I've ever found. Uh, I've never found anything better than this. It's give yourself permission to write a crummy first draft. Okay. It's that desire to have everything be perfect that locks you up. And so if you have any talent at all, that crummy first draft is not going to be crummy. And uh, there's a famous saying that you can't edit what hasn't been written. The, the, the tap needs to be open for the words to flow. So if you give yourself permission to write that crummy first draft, that is like a battering ram that goes through uh, writer's block, which comes from perfectionism. That's where it stems from. Okay. Amen. I've got five words for you. We're going to close it out with this. I, uh, my pr producers and my uh, team, after reading the book, I'm going to say five words. I'm going to say the word. You think of whatever comes to your head. Ready? Yep. I say the Pentagon. You say what? Professional. Okay. Conscience. Courage. I say the word service. You think of what? Patriotism. Okay. Okay. I say two words. Scott Harvath. Is that you, Brad Thor? It, it's, it is me to a large degree, but it, more than that, it's an homage to the men and women that go do some of this nation's most dangerous business away from their families. I tell people that there is no American dream without those willing to protect it. And then I go further and say, what does the American dream look like for those who do protect it? And that I wrestle with a lot in the books. Right. Now it's interesting because they do make incredible sacrifices. Mm -hmm. Okay. I say the two words, Brad Thor, you say what? <laughs> Junior. Cause I think it makes me think of my dad, the Marine and he's senior and I'm Brad Thor Jr. Okay. See, I see incredible life force. That's what I think. I see incredible life force, boundless energy. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Thor, thank you very much. The title of the book is shadow of doubt. It's another incredible thriller. Who is this good looking guy on the back of this book, by the way? Is there any? What's going That's on called there? Is there any digital, digital Botox. Is, is yes. there any filtering going it, it's on a, there? It's okay. a 10 year old, it's, it's a 10 year old photo. Guy? I need to get, I need oh, well, to get God, back in front of the God camera. God bless you. It's in bookstores now. The, uh, the, I don't know who the narrator is, but the audiobook uh, version Armin is Schultz. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. yeah he's, he, great. he's been with you for a while because I Long recognize time. his voice and, and, yeah. uh, the book is phenomenal. I wish you great success and thank you so much for coming on open book. Thank you. Good to be here. And please give all my love to your wonderful mother-in-law, Anthony. All right. There you go. See, you know, you know what you're doing. Okay? You know what you're doing.